Today's event will be conducted in both English and Spanish with interpretation into both languages. To listen to English interpretation of the comments in Spanish on a computer, locate the globe icon along the bottom row of your screen and select English. If you're joining via the Zoom app on a mobile device, look for the three dots at the corner of your screen. It'll be at the top of your screen on an iPad, at the bottom on everything else, and then click on those three dots. A menu will open up, select language interpretation, and then from the next menu, select English, and be sure to click done at the top right. Do not select mute original audio, as that may prevent you from hearing some of the speakers, even when they are speaking your language. These instructions will also be copied in the chat for your reference. I will now read them in Spanish. El evento de hoy se llevará a cabo tanto en inglés como en español con interpretación a los dos idiomas. Para escuchar a la interpretación al español de comentarios en inglés en su computadora, haga clic en el icono del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior de la pantalla y seleccione español. Si se está uniendo a, por medio de un dispositivo móvil, busque los tres puntos en la esquina de la pantalla y haga clic en ellos. Luego seleccione Language Interpretation, Interpretación del Idioma. Elija su idioma, haga clic en Done o Listo, arriba a la derecha. No seleccione Silenciar Audio Original, ya que le podría impedir el oír a algunos de los les locutores, aunque estén hablando su idioma. Estas instrucciones se van a copiar también en el chat. Over to you, Callie. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. I'm Callie Anderson. I'm the Director of Audio Journalism and Professor at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism at the City University of New York. Uh, today, I'm very excited to uh, be presenting along with our audio, um, along with our bilingual journalism program, this panel discussion on bilingual uh, Spanish English podcasting. And uh, just uh, one more sort of housekeeping thing, please put your questions for our panelists. We will be having time at the end to ask questions of them. Please put them in the Q&A question box, which is different than the chat. So you should see it on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Uh, we have two of the graduate students at the school, Tasha and Santiago, who will be monitoring that Q&A box and uh, voicing the questions you have. And you can put them in English or in Spanish. Um, and we will um, pose them as many as we can to the panelists at the end. Um, and I will be, we will be giving this last bit of instructions in both English and Spanish, Spanish to follow. But after that, as you just heard, um, you will just be able to press the interpretation box and we won't be repeating things uh, necessarily in both languages anymore. Um, that said, I would like to, in English, uh, first introduce our moderator, uh, Alana Casanova Burgess is the uh, host and producer for La Brega, uh, Stories of the Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican Experience. Uh, she was previously a reporter and producer for the Peabody award-winning national public radio show on the media from WNYC Studios and for the Brian Lair Show. She has been producing audio journalism for the past decade. Her work has also been featured in The Guardian, 99% Invisible, Throughline, The New Yorker Radio Hour, Latino USA, and many other places. Um, in 2021, she was part of a team that won the Alfred L. DuPont Columbia University Award for Blind Spot Tulsa Burning. Um, and in 2018, she was a Livingston Awards finalist for her reporting from the island after Hurricane Maria. She has roots in the Carib Caribbean, uh, Brooklyn, and uh, much to our delight at the Craig Newmark Graduate School of Journalism as uh, one of our alumni and also uh, one of our uh, instructors here at the school. And I would now like to pass it over to my wonderful colleague, Carmen Graciela Diaz. Thank you, Cali. Buenas tardes a todos. Saludes. Un placer estar en esta tarde con ustedes. Eh, me hace mucha ilusión que tengamos esta parte en español también. Ya les han comentado eh, que tenemos esa posibilidad. Estamos acogiendo el bilingüismo. Mi nombre es Carmen Graciela Diaz. Soy la directora de especialización del programa de periodismo bilingüe de la Craig Newmark eh, Escuela de Periodismo Graduado en CUNY. Eh, me hace mucha ilusión que tengamos hoy a Lana, a Zaire y a Eric. Muchas gracias a Cali Anderson por este evento eh, que nos ha permitido eh, copresentar. 
Muchas gracias también a Santiago Flores y a Tasha Sandoval que van a estar encargándose de filtrar sus preguntas a nuestros panelistas. Y bueno, un recordatorio nuevamente de housekeeping, que por favor dejen eh, sus preguntas en el, la cajita de Q&A en la parte inferior de la pantalla. De ese modo, Santiago y Tasha pues, pueden eh, enviarlas y manejarlas acá. Y recuerden que tenemos interpretación en vivo. Es un placer para mí presentar a Alana Casanova Borges, así que adelante Alana y bienvenidos a todos. Hola, gracias Carmen. Eh, bienvenidos, bienvenidos todos. Eh, aquí tengo el bio para hacer Quevedo. He is an artist and journalist. Quevedo began as a reporter with Youth Radio in Oakland, California at the age of 15 in 2008. Since then, his work has been featured on NPR, Marketplace, BBC Shortcuts, Love Me on the CBC, McSweeney's Quarterly and Radio Atlas. In 2018, his piece Espera received the Third Coast RHDF Director's Choice Award and his other piece The Quevedos was nominated for a Best Audio Documentary Award by the International Documentary Association. It is a truly beautiful piece. Uh, the following year, he won the 2019 Third Coast Gold Award for Best Documentary for The Return, which I listened to this weekend and, uh, and made my eyes pretty sweaty. He's the recipient of the 2021 Signal to Noise Award from Union Docs for his upcoming documentary, Terms of Endearment. Quevedo was the fall 2019 podcaster in residence for the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and has worked for The Daily at The New York Times, Audible, Latino USA, and Vice News. So welcome to Sarah, and also welcome to Eric Galindo, a five-time telly award-winning writer, director, and producer, originally from Southeast LA. He's the creator and host of Idolo, the Ballad of Chalino Sanchez. And he also created, hosts, and is the head writer for the hit immersive storytelling podcast, Wild, for LAS Studios, and co-creator and executive producer of the Mexican Beverly Hills for CBS, so cool. He has written essays on life and culture for the New York Times. Los Angeles Times and LAist. Whew. He was the first managing editor of LA Taco where he won a James Beard, James Beard Foundation Award along with his business par partner, Patty Rodriguez. Eric recently launched Sin Miedo Productions to write and produce Latinx stories in podcast, TV and film. So welcome Eric as well. Um, your bios leave me breathless. Um, so maybe we can take a moment to hear some tape and maybe hear from uh, Sarah first. Do you wanna set this up in terms of how we uh, work across languages? And I know you consider the crisis to be a bilingual podcast. So do you wanna set up what we're gonna hear here? Yeah, sure. Um, so just, a, I guess a line or two of setup of the story that'll be important to kind of understand the clip. Um, the crisis is a podcast um, that I worked on with a large and very talented team at Vice News. Um, that is essentially the story of um, two union leaders in Colombia who were murdered, um, both whom worked for a coal mine um, run by an Alabama-based company called Drummond. Um, and so the series is sort of looking at those murders and trying to understand that kind of the historical context um, around them and also the allegations um, around the company um, and their involvement and um, and also who these two men were um, and why um, why this sort of like what these murders might tell us about sort of these larger stories about globalization capitalism and all of that good stuff um, and so Victor the, the names of the two men were Victor Casita and Val Valmore Locarno and so um, the clip that we're going to hear is um, about the day that Victor goes missing. And um, I would just say, you know, if you're someone who speaks English and Spanish, like pay attention to the way that the language sort of plays with each other, because that was something that we, we thought about a lot um, when we were producing this was sort of like, what is the interplay between um, the Spanish language tape and the English language, with English language scripting. And I, and I imagine that we'll get into a larger conversation. So I'll leave it there. And I guess I should say, we should say that there's a little bit of violence in this clip, though, not graphic violence, just sort of an allusion to it. Um, and this is from The Crisis. The Spanish version is called Contra Natura, right? Right. Yeah. The next week, Lisa waited for her husband to come home. He usually returned in the afternoon. But as it got late, she fell asleep. And 
then she got a call. It was Victor's sister. She said that one of Drummond's buses had been stopped by armed men and the mine workers had been forced off the bus. That they had killed Balmore right there on the side of the road and pulled Victor into a truck. Later that evening, Elisa gets another phone call, this time from a union member named Gustavo Soler. Yo fui la que cogí la llamada incluso. Y yo oí cuando yo te yo hola, me dice Elisa, ya apareció Víctor. Cuando él me dice Gustavo ya, tells Elisa that they had found Victor. Yo dije, ay, gracias a Dios. Y yo le digo, ¿dónde está Víctor? Where she asks. En la morgue de Bosconia. En the morgue, in Bosconia. Victor's body was found by the side of the road. Elisa says that when she goes to identify Victor at the morgue, what she notices the most is the expression on his face. He looks helpless. O sea, él quedó con los ojos abiertos. Y la mirada que él tenía era como una cara como cuando de impotencia ya, cuando como que no puedo hacer nada. They had tortured him. Fue un hombre que yo quise mucho. Ningún ser humano merece morir así, y él menos. Nobody deserves to die like that, Elisa says. El menos. Especially him. El menos. So what's the, the thinking there with, with using um, so much untranslated tape? Um, I mean, I think a, a huge part for me of what makes audio so great and why it is such a wonderful medium is that like so much is carried in the tone of voice and in the cadence of the voice and in the sound of the voice that can't be translated right that is like so like when you're listening to that end of her saying like you know saying el menos right like you like really get the sense of the weight of this thing even if we're not sort of like directly translating it over and over again um and and so my my hope in sort of not directly translating every single thing that being is being said is that um, if you understand both languages, like great, you're going to get even more of the weight of that feeling. But even if you don't, you'll be able to hear in the sound of the voice and, and hear in the cadence of the voice, sort of what's happening emotionally. Um, and so that was that was a huge a huge part of it. And um, and I just yeah, I think that's a that's the experience that we tried to sort of give. Um, listeners throughout the series um, was was sort of to understand the feeling of what's happening, regardless of sort of um, access to to either language. Well, what's the thinking there in terms of making a version that pretty much stands on its own in, in Spanish? Is it about accountability, given that Drummond is an Alabama-based company, but you're telling a story about something that happened in Colombia? Like, what what's the relationship there? Yeah, I mean, I think it was it was just sort of um, we wanted the I, I, the way I'd sort of pictured it in the way that we talked about it was sort of that the English version was not an English version. The English version was a bilingual version and the Spanish version was a completely Spanish version. Um, with the idea that like, I think English, <laughs> English only is over. No, but like, it, but kind of like, it was like, you know, it was this feeling of like, you know, if folks are speaking Spanish, let's not assume that everyone who's going to listen to this podcast only speaks, uh, only speaks English. Um, that seems like, cause I, I listening to the, right. Like I'm, if I'm listening through the script, and I'm having to listen to a direct translation of a thing that was just said over and over and over again. Um, that's really taking for granted my attention and my time. Um, and so really trying to think through that, um, not assuming that every person who listens to the podcast only speaks English and trying to like respect their time as much as, as anyone else is. Um, and I think it was a little bit, yeah, it was a little bit of accountability and definitely um, just wanting to reach as many folks as possible. Cause you know, like, this story is a story about Colombia. So hopefully people in Colombia, like our, our host is from Colombia. So like really trying to be intentional about making sure the most number of people who can understand it can, can listen to it and hear it. So Eric, do you wanna jump in on any of that and the idea that uh, maybe English only is dead or bilingual versus one language versions of things? 
I mean, I think, you know, for the longest time, um, I, I can speak especially about written, like when you read news articles peppered with, you know, French language and like no one, no one's translating the French, you know, like Edith Piaf's La Vie en Rose slaps in any language. And I think that Sayer's completely right about audio being much more about tone. So this comes up every time I do a podcast, especially when I'm doing it with people who are not Spanish speakers. And I always say, we'll let them catch up. You know, like I had to catch up as a kid. I didn't know English. Um, there was a lot of words in, in movies and films and books and newspaper articles that I had to go look up to learn because they were uh, English was not my dominant language. And now I've caught up and now I want everyone else to catch up. So I think that that is, I completely agree <laughs> with Sayer. Like, at least for me, English only has definitely always been dead. I've never been English only, so I don't know, you know. So do you want to set up this piece of tape you brought from Chalino um, and what, what folks are going to hear? Yeah, so I think, you know, for us, we, we were doing a podcast that was about a very specific moment in time, you know, the 90s. Um, and also it was about a place. And the place was split in two, like many immigrant stories are. And it's a story in Mexico, set in Mexico, but it's also a story set in LA. And we firmly believe that the lens through which you tell stories matters. And we wanted the host to be a reflection of that. So we wrote episodes in English and in Spanish all together as a team, but there was an understanding that the Spanish version was not going to be a direct translation of the English version. And it was going to be its own thing, its own story told through the lens of somebody who grew up in Mexico. And the English version was going to be told through the lens of me, right? Somebody who grew up in Southeast LA in the nineties. And, and you'll hear this clip, which is ex it basically the same part of the episode in English and Spanish, but you'll see how the lens really affects how the story is told. And we should say, I guess, that your your co-host Alejandro Mendoza is the second voice that folks would Yes, hear. Alejandro Mendoza, who's great, beautiful musician, storyteller, works at Vice everywhere. News of Chalino's death came with a figurative and literal shock for my older brother, Paul, a tough-ass teenage outlaw in his own right, who idolized him. I remember him coming home that day. He didn't say anything, but he was clearly upset and wanted to play a Chalino Sanchez cassette tape in our jammed family boombox. But Paul forgot to unplug the portable radio. When he tried to dislodge a stuck Gloria Trevi cassette tape with a file down screwdriver, a small electrical current knocked him back. All the way out for what felt like an eternity. After he recovered, he came into the living room and announced through hard fought tears, they killed Chalino as if he had lost someone close to him. I just sat there on the floor of a near empty room in our little yellow house on House Street, just a few blocks away from where Chalino lived with his wife and two children my age. And I wondered who the they that killed him were. I never thought one day I'd be sitting across from Chalino's best friend and band leader, Nacho Hernandez, trying to find answers to that question. Cada quien a su casa. La primera vez que escuché una canción de Chalino Sánchez fue en Uruapan, Michoacán, a más de mil kilómetros de Sinaloa. Yo crecí en la Ciudad de México, pero pasaba gran parte del año en Uruapan, visitando a mi abuela y a mis primos. Tenía alrededor de ocho años cuando escuché una canción suya en un puesto de discos pirata ahí en la plaza central de la ciudad. En ese entonces ni le di importancia a su música porque era una oferta más que se había convertido. cambió la vida. Mi primera patineta. 
con la patineta llegó el punk rock y mi cabeza estalló al ritmo de los guitarrazos con distorsión. Quería patear, romper algo y hasta gritar. Un verano, cuando tenía 11 años, llegué a Uruapan con discos de No FX, Green Day, Rancid, emocionado por mostrárselos a mi primo mayor, de quien buscaba aprobación constantemente. Me dijo, esa es música de locos, pinche chilango. Escucha esto. Y puso un disco de éxitos de regional mexicano. Ese verano absorbí lo más que pude del género y volví a la ciudad. Cuando les mostré las bandas que descubrí a mis amigos, las rechazaron. Mi gusto por esta música se consolidó a puertas cerradas. Cool. Um... I love that writing. Did you both do interviews together as well? No, we, we split the interviews up. I did all the interviews in the US and he did all the ones in Mexico. Um, neither, of, I mean, it was during the pandemic, neither of us traveled across the international border. Um, and yeah, and mo most of our interviews were done in person. We did do a lot of Zoom stuff uh, with like the academics, but with people who were Um, readily available to us, we definitely went and talked to them. But yeah, I mean, I, I do think it really clearly does show like, when you listen to see the, the English version of, of Idolo, it really is a survivor's story, like a story of like survivor's guilt that a lot of us have, who, um, you know, are the descendants of immigrants who get caught up in very violent, vicious circles. And if you listen to the Spanish version, it's really a story of, you know, what it's like to grow up in that world and how you sort of the balancing act you have to do, which is to, ex to basically accept the reality, but also like turn it into art or Ooh. try and investigate why it occurs. And, and I think that it's, it's beautiful if you are an English and Spanish speaker, which is definitely who we were targeting with the show because you can listen to both versions and get a lot of new information in either of them. So it was like, a, it was told for everybody, you know? I, uh, I have a piece of tape and, you know, now we're in like year 17 of this pandemic and Zoom <laughs> sharing is still the best, easiest thing for us audio professionals to do, but this one's pretty short. Um, so I think there's sort of a spectrum here. Like there's the Sarah method of, Uh, doing some sort of bilingual work, like, right, there's no English version, there's just a bilingual version. And then there's what you're doing, Eric, which is like the two hosts with two different perspectives, bringing either side of the border to this. And then there's La Brega, which is somewhere in the middle. Like, I thought we were doing bespoke translations before I heard the Chalino podcast. And then I was like, this is next level shit. Um, but So with La Brega, you'll hear in this clip, this is from a special we did for Reyes on snow, uh, that a time that snow was brought to San Juan. And there's archival tape, which obviously only exists in one language. But then you'll hear how I did interviews in two languages for sources who were bilingual. So you'll hear that. But the star of the newsreel is not Puerto Rican at all. She's a tiny ambassador for this white Christmas. To San Juan, Puerto Rico, from New Hampshire's White Mountains, comes 12-year-old Nancy Conway, the Snow Princess. Nancy is bringing to this torrid zone commonwealth a commodity unknown here, but plentiful in Nancy's home state. Transported by airplane belly The Snow Princess comes down the airplane steps in a cable knit sweater and a winter hat. Doña Fela and a couple of kids in traditional costumes greet her. Watching it, You wonder how much snow is melting during all that pomp and circumstance. Did, do you remember trying to taste it? Yeah, I did. I ate it. It was ice, you know, a big surprise. In Puerto Rico, we, we put flavor to the piragua. The piragua. Which is a cone of ice. With a syrup, with a sugary flavor on top of it, and it's delicious. And it didn't taste like my piragua. It tasted like nothing, like water, which... It is what it is. What's the fuss? There's nothing to it. Tastes like nothing. Pero la estrella de este noticiario no es boricua. Es una pequeña embajadora para esta blanca Navidad. 
To San Juan, Puerto Rico, from New Hampshire's White Mountains, comes 12-year-old Nancy Conway, the Snow Princess. Nancy is bringing to this torrid zone commonwealth a commodity unknown here, but plentiful in Nancy's home state. Transported by airplane belly boat, desde las montañas de New Hampshire, según el locutor, llega la princesa de la nieve. Baja del avión en un suéter y un gorro de lana. Doña Fela y un grupo de niños en disfraces le dan la bienvenida. Hay otro niño, el hijo de un ejecutivo de Eastern Airlines, vestido como un jibarito. Hay unos bueyes y una carreta. Y niñas en vestidos de flamenco, lo cual tampoco tiene sentido. Mientras lo ves, es inevitable preguntarse cuánta nieve se ha perdido durante toda esta ceremonia. Antonio cuenta que cuando recibieron la nieve en Puerta de Tierra, él y los otros niños se vistieron en ropa blanca, color que no duró mucho. Se pusieron marrón, naranja, cuando la nieve se convirtió en fango y la ilusión se derritió literalmente en nuestras manos, sobre nuestros cuerpos, en la cabeza. Apenas dio tiempo para saborear un poco, literalmente, pero nada, era una piragua sin frambuesa. Cuando empezó a derretirse, ya era piragua. Pero piragua sin sabor. Sin sabor, el hielo nada más. Le faltaba la frambuesa. Una piragua sosa que no duró mucho. No, no duró nada. So a friend from Argentina pointed out to me that piragua is not, has other names elsewhere, right? Like, what do you all call piragua, like a snow cone? Yellow. Yeah, that's, a, that's what I've heard too. Yeah. So anyway, we translated it in English and then I sort of regret that I didn't, I didn't do a solid on the Spanish. Um, but I, someone asked in the chat and everyone should be putting their questions in the Q&A box. But anyway, I'll direct the question to you both. How much could you calculate like how ha much harder it is to make an episode in two languages? Like, is it, uh, is it like 50% harder or like 100% harder? I would say 100 because it's basically you're making two shows, at least for us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I say, I say this not to be uh, contradictory, <laughs> but it's actually, e it's easier. I think for me, it's harder. But again, I think it gets back to this question that you're talking about of the approach to, to the bilingual work, right? Which is like, for me, it's easier because I can understand, understand Spanish and English. It's easier for me to like write a script around the Spanish tape. Yeah, rather than thinking about it, about it as like a whole separate part of the thing um, as a separate, part of the story. Um, I don't know. Yeah, it feel it, it it felt it felt more natural because I could just like I could be scripting and then throwing tape in and not really thinking too much about it. Um, and like, you know, the sort of if I'm passing it by someone who only speaks English then like that gives me some ideas of like, oh, maybe we interpret a little bit of that or maybe we add that part. But um, I found it to be much, much easier Um, I think when you're directly, well, the question of then translating it all into Spanish into an all Spanish version is a completely different thing. I think that is much harder. I did not have to do that, <laughs> thankfully. Um, but the bilingual version for sure, um, it just felt like cool. Like I don't, I'm, you know, I'm just using this tape and, and I, it felt or pretty organic to the process. Did you do it first in Spanish or first in English or first in, in bilingual? You're on mute. First bilingual, sorry. <laughs> oh, gotcha. Yeah. What about you, Eric? First English, first you did it both at the same time, right? Yeah. So we would we would actually trade off episodes and um like as a lead 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 writer, me and Alex. And um like I'd take episode one and then he'd go write episode two while I was writing episode one. And then um uh Juan Diego uh Ramirez would I mean Juan Diego would translate Juan Diego, so we had a couple of producers, Juan Diego and Lily, they would translate it literally from Alex's Spanish to English or from my English to literal Spanish. Then we would take that and do a rewrite in our own voice. And we also had editors on both sides of the border just because not only was it a Spanish, but it was a very specific type of Spanish um uniquely northern mexican dialect 
And so we had to have like, we wanted to make sure that we were being very authentic to the voice that we were trying to capture. Um, so that's why we had like two sets of editors. And yeah, so we would go back and forth. Um, and it was, yeah, I mean, and, and the other thing is we're dealing with the subject matter that's very um, like tricky, you know, uh, nautical culture in in mexico especially like for the our team in mexico who's got to live there and, and continue to work there so there was a lot of like nuance that we needed to make sure like was filtering through and and it, yeah i think it's very much like for this specific type of podcast that we did it was like doing two shows targeting two different audiences and with two different like things like and and if you listen to either little in English, I can say things like more definitive about who I think killed Chalino because I am not a Mexican journalist, you know? Whereas like as a Mexican journalist, you have to be way more careful about things like that, for example, or even just your opinion about narco culture or narco music, you know? And for me, I'm very privileged to just be like, yo like i'm from la in la we stay real we say what we mean whatever you know and and it's it's a whole different thing and also like to not be disrespectful to anyone living or dead because these are very um complicated people with very you know who have lived very dangerous lives i like that oh i'm sorry alana you might oh no go for it no, no. I, I just yeah i mean i think that's such an important point that you're making eric too like i think something that I don't want to get lost is like bilingual podcasts are about language, obviously like on a very surface level, but they're like, I think it's like, that's 10%. That's like the tip of the iceberg is language. And then the other 90% is context, right? And like specific geographic, cultural context, like this, the yeah. context of the reporters that you're working with and the producers that you're working with. Like I feel so um, grateful for the crisis that we worked with Ramon Campos, who was the, the host out of Colombia because um, not only had he sort of been covering um, so many different aspects of life in Colombia, which is a huge country, um, but also just very specific regionally to the place that we were focused on, which was Cesar. Um, he had worked there, so he knew people. He understood a lot about um, like the spe specific cultural context of that place in a way. And like similarly, um, would sort of say things like, well, we can't not mention this thing because if I was from Cesar and I listened to this podcast, I'd be like, why the hell haven't they mentioned that? Um, <laughs> and so I think it's really, um, yeah, I, it's like, I, I love what you're saying, Eric, because it it's a good reminder that like, when we're talking about making work in two languages, we're also talking about making work um, across contexts. Um, mm -hmm. And that, like, that is, that is so much more of what you're, thinking about in scripting beyond just like, did I translate that word correctly? Like, um, I just, yeah, I think it's super important. Exactamente. Voy a cambiar ahora a español un momentico para, para los otros que, que, estén aquí, que están aquí. Pero, por ejemplo, tenemos dos productores para La Brega que viven en Nueva York y dos productores que viven en San Juan. Así que tenemos como ese lente de la diáspora representado, claro, pero también ese lente que, que está en, en la isla y que entiende que un party de marquesina es algo súper específico, súper puertorriqueño, súper boricua, que no vamos a, a interpretar para, para todo el mundo, ¿no? Que, como dijiste, like catch up, right Si no entiendes mm. lo que es una marquesina, que lo busques. Métete al Google, entonces. <risa> sí, piragua, piragua, aunque no sepas, a, a mí me... Me da gusto que piragua es la palabra que usaste en español porque es muy específica, ¿verdad? Uh -huh. Estás, ves al, al uh, the street vendor que vende piragua es muy diferente al street vendor que vende hielos mexicanos. Uh -huh. so, so cuando digo, nomás usando esa palabra que es very specific to, to Puerto Rico, automáticamente es una escena específicamente que te lleva a Puerto Rico. Y también quiero decir que La Brega, oh my God, beautiful, beautiful podcast. It was so inspirational and in everything I did for Talino because it was so like, oh my God, like just telling the story of a place through scenes and characters and people. And oh my God, I just, I love La Brega so much. I just wanted to say that. 
FIFA oh, Women's Day. Sí, es bueno, muy bonita, muy bonita. Bueno, hablando de eso, porque yo trabajé con Marlon Bishop de Futuro Studios y yo sé que tú trabajaste con él también. Y Sarah, que vienes de Latino USA, está en tu pedigree, que es donde también traba, trabaja Marlon Bishop. <risa> Que primero, props a Marlon Bishop, que es el, el gringo más encantador que hay. Número dos, <ríe> pero también podemos hablar un poco de, de cómo esa influencia de futuros estudios de Latino USA, de trabajar para una audiencia que entendemos que muchas veces es bilingüe, ¿no? No sé, como sí. no, hay, no hay pregunta ahí más que nada decir que futuros estudios, hablarlo. <ríe> Yo le mandé un, un, un día después de que ya, ya, habíamos, ya habíamos terminado, estaba sentado y, y pensé yo, man, Marlon Bishop es un genio. He's a fucking genius. Y le mandé un mensaje, le mandé un texto, le dije, oye Marlon, uh, no tienes que responder, pero nomás quiero decirte que yo creo que eres un genio. Uh, porque el trabajo que ha hecho con muchos, todo, anything for Selena, like La Brega Latino USA, uh, So many, uh, uh, Futuro is doing remarkable work and they've been doing it with many, the fact that they've been able to work with not many, not only many different hosts and writers, but also different companies and partnerships and delivered on across all levels, I think shows like just how special that place is and, it, and the talent that keeps coming out of there is like beyond. So totally agree. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. And I also think that it's, um, I mean, I think what's what's so special, I mean, so many of people that I respect have come through, I worked at Latino USA specifically, um, but so many people I know and love and who are my friends and colleagues or people who I admire have come through Futuro or worked with Futuro at one point or another. Um, and I think one of the things that's so special too about Futuro is that it is, um, is exactly what we're talking about, right? It does a lot of exactly what we're talking about of sort of like really um, celebrating and highlighting how multidimensional we, in quotation marks, we are, right? Like this idea that like the experience of Latinidad is so complicated and that it can't be sort of just like one version of a thing. It's got to be multiple versions of a thing and be understood in different languages and different contexts. Um, and I would say also just that my time at Latino USA really informed the way that I think about how we approach this work as well. Like it never, when we started on the crisis, it never occurred to me that we would just do a version where we're like straight translating stuff because that's just not the way that we did things. Like I, I think there was always the assumption that someone who is listening would, wouldn't just, would understand Spanish, that we weren't, that it wasn't just an afterthought. Um, and I think, unfortunately, um, I've also had experiences in other places where that's not the case, right? Where it's like, you know, um, speaking another language or like language itself is not seen as being um, a highlight. It's seen as sort of a barrier to getting to meaning, which I think is a, a disappointing way of utilizing and thinking about language, right? When like so much of what we do is about the power of the human voice and about the power of sound. Um, and so, um, so yeah, I think, I think it's, I think it's an incredible, I love Futuro and I think that they've, they've done so much, um, not just for obviously me uh, as an individual and us as a group, but also um, for the landscape of the audio industry in general. I mean, picking up on what you just said, the idea, like audio journalism, like the, the tape that you had in, in your clip and, and the tape of um, Antonio Martorell and Ignacio Rivera talking about Piraguas, it's sort of the like quintessential emotional tape. It's like the tape that you would pick regardless of what language you were working in because it's where you can feel like the most passion in it. And I think, I'm just thinking about when I put together a script, I'm really looking at who, um, I'm, I'm looking for like the most emotional tape that's going to work regardless of whether someone can like literally understand the words right so so in a way it's a, it's like taking what we do regularly and elevating it to this next level of like oh you can hear the emotion in this woman's voice when she says el menos you know which would work regardless right like yeah. right. it's almost totally. like this, the most special version of what everyone else is doing no offense everyone else <laughs> 
No, I totally agree. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I, uh, there's a version of this. I mean, the this panel is literally called like, uh, you know, how to make a show in two languages. But I guess there's a version of that question that's should you make a show in two languages? And Sarah, you were saying that this is like a, you know, making a bilingual version, like a, how, how should we all be thinking about whether it's appropriate to make a show in two languages or not? I, I think honestly, my Frank, the first thing that popped into my head, um, which, is a, which is a hard answer and maybe a potentially not very, um, it's not gonna be very exciting, which is like, you should do it if you have the resources to do it. Cause like to make a bilingual show, you need a team. Um, I mean, you can do it on your own, obviously, if you're just like super passionate and are like, I'm gonna do this. Um, but I think, I think like having, a, and when I say a big team, I don't just mean like hands on a thing. I mean, like, I don't just mean like all people who speak English and one person who speaks Spanish, um, because I think that is like a reification of some dynamics that are hella toxic that already exist in our industry around like putting more work on people of color to like interpret experience and language um, in work. But I mean, like having the resources to hire people on who have like Eric is talking about, like have the specific geographical context and understanding and experience to really like carry something and understand it and, and write it and interpret it and find meaning in it. Um, I think that that is like, that's the bait. That's the first thing that popped into my head when you asked that question was just like, a, I think, um, I think you should be making a bilingual podcast if you have people who can really speak to the experience of the thing um, versus just literal translation. Cause I, I think that's, a quarter of a quarter of a quarter of the work that gets done um, in a in a series or a or a piece, um, so that's that. Yeah, that's the first thing that popped in my head. I'll try to think of something, <laughs> something nicer <laughs> perhaps. But that was the first thing. That's the first thing that I thought of. It's the first thing I thought of too. Like, if you can afford it, um, definitely you should do it in both languages. I I think, or or even multiple languages. Like, I think Alonde Media did the uh, Maradona podcast in like eight languages. And I mean, I was like, wow. Um, but like, oh man, like I will say yes, it does require a lot of resources, but for the people on the other side who are the investors, it also is a bigger return on your investment, right? So like you do get like, just ba talking like brass tacks, more impressions, uh, more downloads, bigger audience. You know, this is the reason why Netflix exists in everywhere in the world you know but i do think there are stories and i think a lot of the stories that we've told they like sayer said have to be the probably bilingual stories that are better in spanish you know like um and like for me like this is the first podcast that my parents ever listened to and I was talking to people who were like, my son is listening to this, my grandma's listening to this, we're listening to it together. And so it was like multi-generational in a way that was so beautiful that I think that like, that is one of the reasons why I like to tell stories in both languages because I wanna tell stories for all the people I grew up with. And those do include people who only spoke Spanish, people who speak Spanish and English, and even people from the Latin American diaspora who only speak English, you know? So I, I think it's just so like complex. And I always say like, do you? My lens is this, this is how I tell stories. You don't have to do that. You shouldn't do things. You should only do the things that you like really, really connect with and resonate with. Yeah, especially the kind of Fabergé eggs that we're making over here, like that takes so <laughs> long to make them that if you're not in love with the subject matter, like what are you even doing? You're going to oh, you're, yeah. you'll burn out in a couple months. I bro, I, there, there's, I'm sure tape exists of me like crying into the like, again? Why do we have to do this again? Like, <laughs> Version 13, it, final, yeah. final, final draft. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, one thing about that is like, speaking of crying is I, I obviously like I do a lot of interviews in two languages and sometimes go back afterwards uh, very surgically to ask questions. But um, I don't think that I would do an interview like the one that you played, Sarah, it, twice. Like I would not put someone, put a, a person, a source through that emotional hardship twice just for the hat trick of making a 
right? Like that's something we should say out loud. Common um, form interviewing tells us that like you strategize around those sorts of, you know, those sorts of questions. Cause yeah, like it's already re-traumatizing and for people or can be re-traumatizing for people to relive that moment in one language. I can't imagine trying to relive it, especially if it's something if you feel stronger in one language versus another, I'm sure there's some psychological um, effect to, right. try to interpret your experience into a language that is not even comfortable for you in the first place. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, Do you and also, also, I think like um, there are academics that I think are very good in both languages. And those are the people that like you can go and re-interview specifically if you need something. But I, yeah, I wouldn't re-interview like a subject who went through something very traumatic. Right. I mean, yeah. and academics just want to be called over and over again. So that seems like yeah. doing a solid. Yeah. I think we only did we only did it one time on the show on Chalino and it was with the um, a professor who happens to teach corridos at uh, like one of the, the state colleges here in California. And he's actually really, really good in both languages. So we were just, we just re-interviewed him in Spanish a couple times. So we have over a dozen questions here. Um, Tasha and Santiago, do you want to sort of jump in here and? Sure, and, I can. Yeah. I can start. I have a question from Salman that it is. I would love to know if each of you has any advice or techniques for playing interviews in other languages without resorting to a classic starting in the foreign language and then talking as a translator visit. Um. Oh, sorry, Eric. If you want to go ahead, I'm still formulating. I, I, I tend to not like that um, unless there's uh, the tape is really bad for some reason. Like if the tape in Spanish or like in the other language is hard to understand in either English or Spanish, then I think the duck under uh, really works well. But I prefer to just play the tape and sort of recap it like the way uh, if you listen to, to the crisis does. Like I think that is my preference. I think it's a, it's a mix for sure. Um, I try to, like I try to avoid the ducking because it feels very, you know, <laughs> it, I don't have to say it out loud, you know, um, it just feels it feels that way. Um, and but but I and I I really I mean, and again I know that this probably sounds very like heady and like but like the rhythm the rhythm of the thing is really important, and so I think I try to. Um, Think about the tape one in terms of if I was if I spoke both languages, what would I want to hear? Like even if I have to re like translate slightly at, after a thing, like what p what can I keep a couple of details in the tape that are not going to make it into translation? So at least if I if someone speaks Spanish, they feel like they're getting like a little more out of the experience. That's definitely a big a big one. Um, and then yeah, and then down to the rhythm of the thing too, where it's just like, well, what if we have, you know, what if we let her start her sentence and then we finish the sentence and you can understand like that, you know, that, that help, uh, you'll get the meaning of what's being said regardless, but at least you're getting kind of a dynamic experience um, on a listening level as well. Next question. I have nothing to add. Sarah said it perfectly and so did Eric. There's nothing like, Okay, so the next question we have is in Spanish, um, and it's, I guess, primarily uh, directed at Eric. So it says, uh, si ambas versiones de ídolo son diferentes, adaptadas a cada entorno, si, quisi si uno quisiera escuchar el panorama completo, significa que debe escuchar el podcast en ambos idiomas. Si una persona solo habla en español, does that mean they are missing 50% of the story? How did you manage that? Pues, uh, sí, pero la, la, la historia de Chalino sigue siendo igual. Esa parte es, está fundamenta, fundamental en, en los dos idiomas. Lo, lo que sí estás perdiendo es la historia personal de este pelirrojo mexicano que creció en Los Ángeles en los noventas cuando Chalino estaba pegando muy fuerte. Y... Si sí hay poco de eso en, el, en la versión en español, está peppered entre los episodios, pero no está en el, en el front and center de la historia. Y también si nomás escuchas el inglés, no estás escuchando 
perspectiva de alguien que creció un punk rock rockero reportero en Chilango, en México. Esa parte es lo que sí, sí se pierde, pero la, la, la historia de Chalino sigue fundamental en las dos versiones. Sí, yo diría que igual con la brega, que el periodismo que sale es igual, solo que quizás te vas a perder unos chistes que hacemos, por ejemplo, en ese clip um, yo dije algo sobre uh, los trajes de flamenco, que claro, es para yo parar y hacer un explanatory comma de lo que es un jíbaro, un jíbarito en inglés y todo eso, decidimos cortar esa parte en inglés porque como que no te va a dar el sentido, pero en español, para yo decirlo así claramente, es como un value added para esa versión, pero no es, no es como integral, o sea, yo diría, aunque los jíbaritos siempre son integral. <risa> Uh, all right, our next question is from Rebecca that asks, do you have a sense of how many non-Latinos or non-Spanish speakers listen to your bilingual work? Sir? I, would, I don't know how to quantify that, <laughs> honestly. I mean, I know we I know we had a fair amount of listeners in Colombia, um, but it's not, you know, that's not a, like if we're talking about US listeners, like how, I, I, I don't think yeah. they split it up that way. So it's hard, it's hard to say, but I, I, I you know, uh, from the responses, it felt pretty even. Like, I think we got, you know, I definitely got emails from folks in Spanish and emails from folks in English, emails from folks in the US, emails from folks in Colombia. So um, yeah, it's hard, it's hard to say. I'm curious if, if y'all have any sense of that for yourselves. No, I mean, we were pretty 50-50 of both languages, but it's impossible to tell, like, if there are people in that crew who are listening to both versions. We did have people like all around the world listen to the show. Like we had people writing in from India and we can see the metrics and, you know, Israel and stuff like that, which made us think about like, oh, how should we be, you know, like for a next round, how should we be thinking about who our audience is that aren't just like Puerto Rican, you know, like that's a good starting point, but how do, you know, do we want to make it any more accessible? Um, I don't know. Yeah, I also don't know like the, the breakdown, but I do know it was like doing well in like Australia and the UK and in various other places where, where I assume there are not a lot of um, Spanish speakers or at least specifically not like Mexican re region, Mexico regional Spanish speakers. Um, and also like say, what, what Sarah said, you know, anecdotally, like people from all over the place have reached out and, and expressed their appreciation of the podcast of people who don't speak Spanish. So I mean, I yeah, also I don't like to look at the numbers. <laughs> yeah, I don't like that either. Yeah. Can I ask you both a question? I mean, when I listened to Chalino, I, it was like a, you know, cleaning the apartment kind of day. And so I just went through and let the whole thing play. And so I was listening to each episode first in English and then in Spanish, or I forget which way it went. But I know that the feed for the crisis for Contra Natura was organized differently. So I've been listening to that, like all in one go and one in the other. Do, you, do either of you have a preference for like how to organize the feed? That's, that's beyond my pay grade. I do not <laughs> make those decisions. I, I, I will say though, like listening to the crisis or to like uh, Maradona podcast, it was very convenient to like, just listen in one language. Um, uh, but I do think that uh, like the Selena podcast or like loud, I just let it play and it would just go and I was fine. I think I'm, I'd be fine either way personally, so. Yeah, yeah I, think it, it, I think it depends on subject matter. One, like, I don't know if I would listen to the crisis in both languages back to back because it's just such an intense um, story. <laughs> I'm like, I can handle this in one. Let me just do this in one go. Um, Personally, I like what I like what you're saying of the back and forth. I think, like as a listener, that's a more interesting experience. Um, but I also understand that, like my version of how things work, might not be profitable <laughs> for people, um, or like the thing that is actually like most helpful. Um, so, so I would say, yeah. I mean, my personal preference would be the yeah the staggered sort of um, versions. But I don't know if that's sort of like the most successful way to to release something. Mm -hmm. Next question, Santiago or Tasha? 
Yeah, so this next question is, is there ever any backlash to your bilingual content? Is there ever not, I would say. Um, I, I, would, I will say it's gotten less and less, but I remember early on, you know, when I was doing bilingual content, I would get a lot of hate mail, um, you know, a lot of, especially during like the Trump administration, when I feel like there was just a lot more of that going around. It's like magic. It's just fucking God and it's God. I don't know. But um, yeah, a lot of people, especially because, you know, I like to tell stories about the people I grew up with and they happen to be like sometimes like thugs and criminals and like very complicated people. And that, you know, some people might say that perpetuates a stereotype, but it's hard for me to see the people I grew up with as a stereotype. So I get a lot of that kind of stuff. Like, oh, of course you're a criminal and you're all criminals and you know, that type of shit. I don't think we've received, as far as I know, and I may be totally, I might just not have access to those emails. I don't think we've received anything about, bi about the bilingual aspects of um, the story really. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I think we got for sure hate mail at Latino USA, but like, so a lot of that stuff was unhinged anyway. So it sort of felt like whatever. Um, and also like, we were like, what we're doing is great. Um, screw you. So, <laughs> I, I, you know, it was never, it, it never, I would say I've never received any, um, I've never received like creatively constructive hate mail. Like it's never been like, <laughs> I hate bilingual media because of this. It's always, it's right, never, right. you clearly don't like me anyway. Like, I'm just not going to worry about any of this. Um, so no, I've been, I've, I think I've been, you know, very lucky and privileged in that sense that, that I have not experienced that. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't, I was bracing myself honestly for like a Puerto Rican discourse around who are these members of the diaspora who are telling us what it's like to be Puerto Rican, but because our team was so Puerto Rican of all kinds, we did not get that. It's, it's like our, I, I don't know, I'm sure I'm saying these words to the wind and I'm sure tomorrow there'll be some kind of horrible message uh, waiting for me. But no, I think we just like, we we had a team of reporters and producers and editors who were so, you know, there's no one way to be Boricua, right? So like, so representative that people can't say, hey, you suck, because we didn't. <laughs> um, so I think we have like time for one more final thought or one more short question or, Parting words of advice. How do you all want to spend the last the last couple minutes? I, I, whatever y'all think. I don't. I don't have a preference. Should we do some recommendations for other things, other shows to listen to? Oh yeah, that's smart. I like that. Yeah, I I'll put my uh, word in for loud, which is another Futuro Studios production about the history of reggaeton. Very bilingual. To Sarah's point about bilingual work. Evie Queen is like speaking, I don't know, a third language in that podcast. Yeah. I would, yeah, what about you, Sarah? Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just gonna say on that same Futuro tip, I would definitely also recommend anything for Selena if you haven't, if you haven't already listened um, as well. And also um, Authentic, the story of Tableau, which is uh, a series that the team at Vice Audio just, just put out as well. Um, not Spanish language content, but you know, all language inclusive here in this bilingual panel. What is authentic? What, can you say more about that? Give me um, more sentences. It's the story of a um, Korean hip hop star whose life basically gets unraveled by um, a rumor online. Um, and they've been releasing episodes every week, I believe. So I would definitely, um, I would definitely check it out. Nice, Eric? I definitely, if, you, if Maradona is a god, so if you want to listen to the, the Maradona story, I would definitely recommend that. And it's in multiple languages. On uh, It's from Spotify and Alonda Media. Um, I really like um, the ballad of uh, Mississippi Burning, Burning, the ballad of Billy Joe. Oh my God, um, what an incredible uh, piece of uh, audio. Um, that's just in English, but it's, it's so good. Um, I definitely, you know, love La Brega and anything that these two people have done is so good and really laid the groundwork for the work that's happening now, I think, so. 
Before we go, can I just ask one more thing? I saw this uh, this like TikTok the other day and I forgot to save it, but it was about someone trying to figure out if their voice is higher or lower when they switch between English and Spanish. And I don't know if you've seen this, but, and it's been with me ever since. Do you, either of you have thoughts about how your voice changes from one language to the other? <laughs> no, but thanks for putting that in my head. I know, once you start thinking about it, you can't stop. Leave this panel feeling more conscious of my own voice than than before. Good. I will say, I, I, do, I do I do notice when I'm speaking to people specifically from Sinaloa, my Sinaloa accent for sure comes out, um, and so does my parents, and so does anyone, which is like, hey, plebes, qué pasó, plebe, qué andas haciendo allá por allá. I don't understand so. anything you just said. <laughs> <laughs> I think I get a little higher in Spanish. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. I think I go lower if that's possible. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Kelly, Carmen. Thank you all so much for this amazing conversation. I've been laughing and nodding and loving everything about it. Um, thanks, Alana, for moderating and for all your amazing questions, for everyone who sent in questions, um, and to Tasha and Santiago for pulling out some really great questions. I know there are many more. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Carmen. So yeah, there's lots of questions we didn't get to. You know, head to audio Twitter, go to your places, continue the conversation. You know, we're all still there. You can find all these fine folks on Twitter and find each other and keep it, keep it moving. So thank you, Lana, and have a great afternoon, everyone. Thank you.